Hello and welcome to the 62nd episode of Off the Record. I am running on three hours of sleep. Jesse is running on probably a few more hours of sleep than that, but but not much. Um, we each shopped a lot in the last 24 hours. We each saw a pop star. Um, Jesse bought me tickets to see Taylor Swift in concert yesterday. <laughs> What would you do if I bought you tickets to see Taylor Swift with me? Would you not go? I would definitely never. Really? I mean, dude, I, I've seen enough bad shows for a lifetime. Why would I ever, like, people buy me tickets to see things I don't want to see all the time, and there's no way I'm wasting my life on that. Well, I've I... done enough anthropological experiments in my 37 years to know better than going to see Queen Fuck Girl. Yeah, as a graduation present to Grace, I bought her and myself Taylor Swift tickets to go down to Washington, D.C., since uh, Drexel rudely scheduled graduation on the day Taylor Swift was in Philadelphia, and my graduation was at 8 o'clock at night because I go to Drexel. And so we drove down yesterday, and I went to my first ever, like, concert, I think I would deem it. Um, it, was an, it was a very interesting experience. You, you, know, you know, I forgot to take umbrage with you about something. Madison Square Garden is a massive... Oh, I agree. And but So when, to me, like, so the... So I've been to two shows at MSG. Well, I've been to three shows. I, you know, I saw Blink there, I saw Green Day there, and I saw Angels and Airways open for Weezer there. Um, and I've been to one show at um, Barclays, which was Fall Out Boy. And those are all, all obviously massive. But, um, and actually, I think they were all, or three, three out of those four were sold out. But none of them were, you know, they were mostly just like playing their songs. That makes sense. Fall Out Boy definitely had a little more... Um, stuff happening on the stage but you know blink and green day were just doing what they usually do wherever they are um so i hadn't been to like anything with like a stage setup you know if that makes sense with, um, with four screens so you could see queen fuck girl from the million miles away you were from her i was pretty close i mean i was the closest i could have that been that picture did not look close dog i mean i i was i was like the closest i could have been if not in the pit so i don't know it was I wish I was closer for sure. It was interesting because I it was in a baseball stadium and it I, I just didn't know what it would be like. It was an enjoyable experience. Um, the stage was cool. Like it was I. It, so I, so she you was find it great. enjoyable to be be that far away from a band? No, I mean that, look, that's I would my, always rather that, be up front, but I wasn't bummed about it. You know, like I had see, a good see, time. See, I don't I don't feel anything when I'm that far away. That's fair. I like. I can't but blame like basically, you. Basically, if it's not a general admission, thirty five hundred seat or less place, I'm I'm not going because I'm not going to get an, an emotional experience from that. What if you? Uh, so you, I'm just trying to actually now think of you at a sporting event and just imagine how much that would not work. Well, so here's a great example, actually. So I watched the. I had never watched the LCD sound system movie till this weekend. Okay. Um, I was kind of saving it, and I had my like nice monitor set up in the living room, and uh, I was always saving it for when I could like truly take in the hi-fi glory of it, and, and get I was high and get drunk and watch. I, I it. thought, you know, I thought about getting high, but I was actually so hungover from the dance party the night before that I was able to just be chill. He's a 16-year-old girl, everyone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anywho, um. I kind of am a 16-year-old girl after you're I say like, You're like a fuck girl yourself. He's talking about Taylor. You, you better watch your tongue, buddy. <laughs> so, so, but I, like, watch that, and then I remembered the thing that, like, so the, you know, that concert, since you probably don't know, is uh, took place at Madison Square Garden, but what they did is I they, do know about that concert. So they had done a week of shows before that where they did Terminal, Terminal 5, and I got to see them actually three times at Terminal 5 instead. Um, and I should say LCD was one of my favorite bands. I just remember, like, when the Madison Square Garden went on, I was like, I'm not going to even try for this, even though I'd love to see this show, and this band means the world to me, because it's just, it, it, I don't feel anything when I'm in a place that big, and the least bit far away. Like, if I'm not within, like, 100 feet of the stage, and I'm just looking at ants playing, it just doesn't do anything for me. I don't know if this would make sense to you, but I guess, like, I don't know that I necessarily feel connected to Taylor Swift anyway, like... There's no part of Taylor Swift that I can connect to, you know? But, like, for, for Green Day and Blink and... Or, no, for Blink and Fall Out Boy, when I saw them in um, the arena shows they did, I was in the GA, and I wanted to be in the GA because I did feel like I would not enjoy the show nearly as much if I was standing next to seats, if that makes sense. So Yes. And when I saw Green Day, I was on the floor, but in the seats b b uh, behind the GA. 
And I definitely did not enjoy that show nearly as much. Also because Green Day played for three hours and no band should ever play for three hours. unless I agree. Unless I think you're like Bruce Springsteen, Fish, or the dead Grateful Dead probably. Oh, God. Could you imagine sitting through those bands for that long? The drugs for the non-Bruce Springsteen band. So, like, they get you through, I think. Yeah, well, I yeah. mean, duh. I mean, right. it's the same thing as an EDM festival going for 12 hours in a day. Dog. Right. So, yeah, it's just like I, I, I definitely did not feel nearly as connected. And, like, it was so awesome seeing Blink in, like, a GA situation like that because I was really up front, but they were playing at 20,000 people. But with this, I think... And, and and what I mean by that is, like, I feel so close to that music, potentially, because it's had a large impact on many years of my life. But with Taylor Swift, like, in my mind, she is just, she's a pop star. Um, you mean a vacuous fuck girl with real, no, no real emotions who's singing about Starbucks lovers. Dude, she killed, she killed it, though. She's good. She is a good performer. It was good. It was. I mean, cool. anyone at that level gets coached to be a great performer. Yeah, I mean, and it I'm not one to be like every pop star could be manufactured. Like you could turn anybody into that, but anybody who gets to that level has to be a great performer. Totally, and it, it was, and that that's why it was also. I mean, I, I had a really good time at a normal level, but it was also really interesting and cool for me to see. I guess like a performance like that because I've never seen something like that in person. Um, but it was not fun um, coming home because it took forever. But I did stop in Maryland at midnight, Jesse, and I spent $45 on calzones at my wait, favorite. Wait, you, you, you can eat a calzone? Oh, I can eat a calzone. I thought you were vegetarian. I am? I, I, anytime I've had a calzone, I've had it with, like, meat. I've never had a calzone with meat in it to counter you. Well, apparently you're not North Jersey as me, as much of a North Jerseyan as me. I, I have this favorite calzone place and it's just a half an hour outside of DC and Grace and I loved it. And loved okay, it. Here, here's the other problem. Yeah. Your favorite calzone place is not in the pizza belt. That's correct. Oh, can I gosh, tell you, can I tell you, will you give me a minute more about our food? Right, about right, food? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll so you, it's like a college chain called DP Dough. And there used to be one right across the street from me in Philly that we'd get every week. And it, that, like, it closed down, but it so happens that there's one at University of Maryland and we have to drive through it. And so we stopped and then I got a bunch of calzones and she got a bunch of calzones. And then I spent $50 on calzones at midnight to save throughout the week, obviously. I, I was figuring that's what was right. going on. So, and so what man, you're basically and this telling calzone me here. Place, can I tell you what's so incredible? If And if you yes. like hot sauce, I don't know if you like hot sauce. Do you like hot I sauce? I do. They bake the I, I, hot to talk, sauce. I go to the hot, the hot sauce store in Williamsburg. So they bake the hot sauce in the calzone. They don't give it to you on a, as a side. Like they, so, they see, I've had that be good and bad. When oh I've had my it. god, I've never, I've never heard of that anywhere else, and <sighs> it's so good. The, the, there's a place down by Mercury Lounge that used to do that, and uh, it, it was definitely mixed results. I think it depended on who did it. Mm, okay. I'm just going to say this, though. This is clearly because you lived across this and got used to it. You're not eating the real good calzones like Rosario's down well, on the Lower, so East, Lower East Side. Like, you I can't fuck like with a calzone really, from there. I don't really like ricotta. Ricotta. Ricotta? Ricotta? Ricotta, ricotta yeah. Ricotta. I'm not really a big ricotta fan, which makes it difficult because most places mm. you can't get like a custom calzone, so you can't specify no ricotta. Yeah, like ricotta kind of makes the calzone. So I think this is the problem is that you're eating some weak ass shit. I'm eating fake ass calzone, but I'm happy with it. Okay. Whatever makes you happy, buddy. Thank you. So moving on past your bad tasted food and queen fuck girl, your bad tasted music, um, there's a question that starts the show that says, yo, since Saks boys at Apple, which I really appreciate our listeners realizing what a fangirl you are for Apple, have moved full into the streaming. Do you think the company will cease production of iPods? This yeah, comes no. from Mr. At Eastbound Too Fucked. <laughs> I, uh, you know, Jesse, I bet that they won't. I bet that they won't discontinue that. <laughs> I, I th so, so were you shocked by this? No, because it leaked, uh, like... When, okay, when they, were you shocked when you saw the leak? No, I was I was surprised, but I wasn't shocked. Like, I could have easily seen Apple just, you know, getting rid of them tomorrow. But at the same time, they just recycle the parts from the iPhone into the iPod Touches. That's what they've done forever since the first iPod Touch. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you do that? Because there's still... Look, Apple sells 100-plus million iPhones a year. Mm -hmm. 
And so selling 10 million iPods a year is obviously nothing to Apple, but it's still the most music players sold in the world. Um, totally. So why wouldn't you sell... This is the thing. Like Some people were like, who would buy an iPod Touch in 2015? Parents buy them for kids because they play music, they play video games, they really play video games, and you can communicate with them over Wi-Fi. Like It's truly, now just with all the Wi-Fi and data stuff, you can call someone with, you know, with FaceTime audio or Skype or whatever. Like it's a really good device for anyone under the age of 12 to 14 to have from a parent that's mobile, I think. It's also music nerds. Um, one of my side businesses is I do sound for restaurants. So like if a restaurant in New York's PA breaks, I'll go in and I'll exchange free food if I like the place for my labors. And I always install iPods there um, because – one, it's good for storage. And then two, it's that thing of no one's going to try to hook up and try to use their phone on it. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I think it was a smart decision. They added some new colors. And what's most important about the upgrade is the old iPod Touch had, and this is nerdy, please excuse me, had an A5 processor, which was the same processor included on the iPhone 4S. And the new one has an A8 processor, which is the same processor that's on the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. So Apple often for the iPod Touches of yesteryear and for iPad Minis put in the last generation last generation of processors, but they made these iPod Touches fully like state of the art. So it has good it has a gigabyte of RAM and it has the highest processor can have it's 10 times faster with graphics, etc. So I think it's a pretty good purchase, and if anyone is interested in buying an iPod and they have a bunch of multiple gigabyte tiers of storage, um, this is a good purchase. And by the way, do remember, if you have Wi-Fi, uh, you'll be able to use uh, Apple Music or Spotify or whatever, a streaming service, too. So um, I think there's a lot to like with these iPods, actually. Not that yeah. I need one, but not that I would buy one, but... If you don't have a cell phone or you have to be one of those people at work that has a BlackBerry or you have a kid or a younger sibling or whatever, like, it's a good purchase. Um, kind you know of a think, no-brainer to me. You know what I found interesting? I was noticing uh, the, the past week. Um, so I put it on El Capitan and I you put on iOS 9. Oh, you went for it. God, can I, we talk I, I went, about I that went, for one minute now? Um, and I'm now not taking phone calls on my phone. Oh, wait, so you didn't do this with, did you not, did you skip Yosemite? I didn't skip Yosemite, but I found it really glitchy. Okay, because Yosemite had this up, feature too. Yeah, I had a lot of fucked up phone calls though. El Capitan seems to be way more stable with this. And when I get to work now, I literally just throw my phone like at the back of my desk so I can't even see it. Right, and I know I'm just a nerd, but um, that's kind of like the same thing with my watch too when I'm like stationed, well, actually all the time now, but like if I'm at my computer, like I just get, like I just, I don't really use my phone. I use my phone a lot when I'm out because it is my computer. But I don't know, it's just interesting. Like at, they're doing a really good job of making everything work together. And if you don't know, Apple is running public betas for their next uh, generation operating systems for both the Mac and iOS. So if you have an iPhone or a computer or an iPad, you can um, you can submit, sorry, you can download the betas for those services. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I did that on my, I, I did that everywhere actually. And I shouldn't have, um, like what did, what computer did you upgrade? Oh, my la my laptop because I don't really do Pro Tools on it. You, you know I'm still on because Pro Tools is the worst software on earth. You know I'm still on Mountain Lion on my Pro oh, Tools computer. Man, yeah, because yeah, they're the worst. They're I the put worst it on company. All of, I updated everything on all of my machines and devices. I shouldn't have updated really it on my iPhone or my laptop, but I did. And I'm definitely pretty buggy in some areas, but I also really love a lot of the updates. Um, I'm I'm not buggy at all on the uh, laptop, I'm not buggy but, uh, at all but the, on my iMac. The phone is making me insane because even to hang up on somebody, you have to type in your passcode. Oh, not for me, man. I haven't had that once. See, really, I've been yeah. having that problem. No, yeah, I haven't. I actually have not like entered my passcode at all. I um, my iMac is fully stable. My MacBook Pro is not stable at all. 
Uh, and my iPad is running really well and my iPhone is running less well. But uh, they made some really nice changes. And I know this sounds so silly, but I really like the new Notes app. And that's nice. <laughs> and some of the other stuff. But You you and Notes apps can n- never be happy. Yeah. No, but I think this is going to make me happy at least for a few weeks. So, so, you, so you continue with that. Yeah. I've switched my Notes app to Google Docs because that's horrible. You're, no, you're, you're, you're an to- animal. To- totally wrong because most of the time I'm in front of a laptop and it's very rare I take it on my phone and then it's all synced up into the best app for me to use. Why is that? Why not any of the others? Why not Apple's Notes or Evernote? Because it's or- in Chrome and that's the app I use the most. And then I can look <laughs> at it easily by just. So moving on, there's an interesting move that happened. I didn't see a lot of people talk about, which is that CSAC, which is one of the main three publishers. CSAC probably handles the majority of your punk and emo music listening uh, publishing. Um, They're kind of always been the indie publisher because they give a more fair rate to everybody, whereas BMI and ASCAP are trickle down. Um, I'm sorry, trickle up where they take the small artists and pay to the bigger artists, which is why they're totally scum. Oh, my God, we're talking about politics suddenly. Trickle up doesn't have to be politics. That's just a general term that politics use. But, yes, that's also why Republican politics don't work. It's because oh trickle God. down is stupid. Oh, my God. CSAC has bought the Harry Fox agency. I want to say the Carl Fisher agency, which is another rights collecting thing. So this is a little bit interesting because it kind of shows that this area is getting a little bleak and they've all gotten a lot less money. But what's really weird is CSAC was up for sale uh, in recent years, too. Um And it seems like there's some moves around here because these services have to consolidate their data in order to be, and I shouldn't say profitable because they're really nonprofits in some weird way, which I I don't know enough about, but it's always explained to me that that, while they call themselves nonprofits, there's some weird stuff going on. Um, But anyway, there's just not that much money and the efficiency to get more money for RS needs to be made by consolidating and making these databases and data collection in a more centralized place in order for artists to get the decreasingly small share they're getting for their music. Yeah, and so, like, I know this uh, is probably, like, a big eye roll, or not an eye roll, but, like, a don't fall asleep at this moment right now kind of thing. Um, but it's an important, pub- publishing is pretty important um, for the music industry historically. And obviously, like, CDs used to be very important for the music industry as well, even though we can even mention in a little bit that CD sales are ruling the music industry this year. But um, publishing is important. It gives artists chances at opportunities and payment for opportunity, and that's kind of a really important part. That... Um, is is not available elsewhere. And yes, it might be really, really, really improbable that Knuckle Puck gets on a Ford commercial or whatever. But um, it, publishing is just, an, is, has traditionally been in, you know, just another leg of the music industry's importance, like touring, like recorded music, like merchandise. And publishing opportunities and sync opportunities can be a lot, can be more important maybe for, uh, Jesse's Taylor Swift, but uh, that doesn't, there's no reason we want it to go away, I think, is an accurate statement, right? <laughs> They're important, whether it's ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or Harry Fox Agency, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know what would replace this kind of revenue for artists ever. And I think that's like the scary part, I guess. Yeah. Um- Well, I don't think it's going to all but go away. I think this is a move that they're trying to consolidate so they can more efficiently collect and get everybody more money instead of wasting resources where they're pooling the same data. They're seeing the same reports of what's been played and everything. And instead of having two organizations doing that, one organization could do that and make it all the more efficient. Which does sound pretty good. Yes. So the next uh, thing we're going to talk about, oh, yeah, we should also say we were going to discuss the streaming service I designed this week and we decided to push that back because there was so much stuff we felt like we should discuss this week and that's going to take up too much time yes so what we're instead going to discuss is now there was this little thing that was made of the what sounds better uh the apple music title or spotify and then you do a sound test i feel like a lot of these been going on uh npr did the one about whether you can hear hear the difference what's a what's an a b audio test 
An A-B audio test is where you listen to one thing and then you listen to the other and you say what you want. This might be familiar to people who saw the commercials where Coke and Pepsi would do these to each other. Mm-hmm. Um Oh, and A-B more, tests more aren't very accurate. ABY tends to be a much more accurate test, um, uh, which is a better form. But um, anyway, it's funny because I find this all a little silly because, um, one, there's so many variables in the, each of these things. Like Apple now lets you choose sound quality in iOS 9. Title has the two tiers. Uh, Spotify, whether you pay or not, your sound quality goes up. But also with the shitty headphones most people are listening on, the Apple headphones and the Apple laptop that most people are doing, um, I would, from everything I've read over the years and everything I've seen when I've ate, when I've done tests with people, you can't really tell on those devices anyway that much of a difference. Right. So I guess to even dumb it down further, there are always different qualities of music, right? Uh, different well, bit rates and bit rate. resolu- resolutions, right, we should right. probably say. But how that comes across to every individual person is never the same. Um, if I have a MacBook Pro from 2010, there may it could some there could be differences in a MacBook Pro in 2015 when it comes to the sound it exports. Um, if I have Apple headphones, they're definitely different than Beats headphones, which are definitely different than from Stony, Sony Studio headphones, etc. cetera. Um, if I have an iPhone, that could produce different sound quality than a Samsung or an HTC phone, etc. cetera. Um, and so if you put Tidal or Apple Music or Spotify on any of these devices, whatever the bit rate is, whether it's... Um, what, what are they typically, 128 and 256 on these, right? 256, I believe, is the most. Right. You're just not going to tell. Like, the the 99.99% of people who use streaming services are not going to be able to tell. Um, and what's, of course, kind of interesting about this is Tidal sells a plan for $15 more a month for, quote-unquote, audiophiles. But, Jesse, even if you are a, quote-unquote, audiophile and you sign up for Tidal, and you're streaming whatever, Taylor Swift, on your Android device, you still may not really be getting any real, real concrete difference, right? Or one that you could tell if you do a test. Here's the argument I would make, is that if you're an actual audiophile and you've spent all this money on great speakers, like as we've went through, like I have $2,500 speakers at the studio and at home, and it's like, yes, if I really cared, and I should also say this, I'm truly not an audiophile since I just listen on RDO to everything. My vinyl collection gets a lot of dust. But you're going to want to listen on vinyl or a FLAC because you can tell the difference on those speakers. But when you're listening on a laptop or you're listening on your iPhone through the Apple headphones or even your Beats or something you're even paying $200 for, the difference is so minimal, It is kind of ridiculous. We are splitting, you know, the thinnest of hairs here. Right. And that's kind of like people get so up in arms about a lot of this stuff and it drives me crazy because like. (sighs) You know why though? Why? Because it gets clicks. It does. It does. I mean, you reposted it. I did because I was like happy to see that the end result was. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it really doesn't. It, this, this, uh, it's already low resolution, but here's the thing is it's high enough resolution that you're not going to be annoyed by those little audio gremlins like when we used to listen to pure volume in MySpace streams 10 years ago. Right. Or as I like to call it, the dark ages. <laughs> Swoop haircuts, deep fees, low bit rate streams. It was all terrible. Um, I'm just picturing so, you with a swoop haircut. That never happened. Yeah. I mean, I did have a much more large hipstery haircut at that time. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's very Google. Was that your MySpace? Is that your MySpace picture for that dance project you have? What's the no, name again? No, that, that was, that was uh, but by the time I had the dance project, the shaved head was in full effect. Okay. Um, the, the cute promo photos of me very much had a uh, shaved head. But the, uh, no, I think it was the you just moved to Williamsburg dating a girl, the fashion industry uh, haircut type of thing. Okay. That's what I have. Yeah, totes, totes. Totes. So the next thing we were going to talk about in audio quality is this fuckboy of a service called Lander, L-A-N-D-R, which just got $6 million in funding from wise individuals like Nas. Um, Do you like, I, I, know an ad, I know an album named by him. 
Are you uh, proud I'm of me? I'm very impressed. Thank you. He came on stage when I saw Run the Jewels the other week. It was really intense. I was really impressed. Okay. This service is a fucking plague. Well, what is, what is yes. Lander? Uh, 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 it sounds like Grinder. It's even worse. Oh, my God. Uh, There's nothing even wrong bigger, with Grinder, man. Even bigger, uh, bigger disease. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, anywho, uh, Lander basically puts your music through an algorithm and then calls it mastered. And if you like the way it sounds after it's been mastered by their algorithm, then you pay money and you get a master back. And man, is this some silly shit. Um, just because what it basically does is it makes your music more generic. It applies a very generic EQ curve of what's supposed to be right to your music and brings it up to that and will make for a more homogenous thing of music. And so as a master engineer, like the one big thing I would say is that's like very interesting is like um, you... The idea that there's one right is very silly. Like um, a perfect example is uh, the other day um, I got a master and I was like, oh, kind of generic pop punky stuff. And then uh, so I went to do like what I think pop punk sounds good. And then I read the notes and they really wanted it to sound like a band that uh, off the record is familiar with because Zach manages them, uh, the Have Mercy record. Mm. And so the Have Mercy record is very not typical pop punk sounding. So I went in that direction. I was like, man, you know, not doing just the generic pop punk thing because I got no instructions really gave this band a much better character because they had a little bit more depth. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't take away from music is that coming up with like, and this is what I do when I start producing any band is I try to find like a unique approach for a band. And I try to find what's good about them and what's good about their influences and how we can take that so they don't sound like every other band out there. It's not just another generic full up boy rip off that we've heard a million times or whatever the case may be. And this is the opposite of that. And it's just really disappointing to see this getting funded and pushed. Does this concern you at all for your job? Uh, I don't think here's what I would say is uh, I'd be fearful for the person who's coming up and starting to master. I have such an insane business and growing business that I don't see that people are going to really want to use the computer algorithm. And honestly, my rate isn't far away from this. And you get a hand touch instead of an algorithm um, with my rate. Like, honestly, I already charge very little in order to for me to work on tons of music every week instead of just doing a couple records and taking a big payday. I'd much rather do tons of records. It's true. It's true. I, uh, I give Jesse music to master once a month, and he just charges me um, Taylor Swift tickets. Do, like, you think, do you think this will catch on, though? Oh, I mean, it's already doing good business, and it will do good. And you know what I could totally see it for is, like, the person who just wants no hassle and doesn't really care and just wants to get it out there or wrote a song for their um, significant other and just wants to get it to sound a little better. I mean, you'd be shocked how many times I get that record of just somebody wrote a song for the girl, and they're really concerned that it sounds loud like their favorite uh, fuckboy record instead of, uh, like, their bad mix. So... And, you know, who am I to say whether they should place that value or not? But, yes, it will continue to get more popular, but it's never going to replace getting good mastering. And the people who really care about their music are going to know better than to do this. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Um, like, it's, it seems like a no-brainer service to create for someone. Mm -hmm. Because I think it would be really easy to try to get people to be like, oh, my God, why wouldn't I just do this? I don't have to deal with anyone and it, whatever. Nas likes it. Um, also, Noisy counted it. Noisy said it is a leading thing for the future of DIY music. Yeah, that's uh, pretty silly. I'm sure uh, whichever friend of the publicist wrote that uh, has a lot of integrity. <laughs> that was sick. Well, it's the fucking truth, too. We all know it that some fucking dumbass publicist is like, can you please write this? I know you're right for this. Do me a salad and I'll buy you a beer at the White Lung Show. Whoa. Going hard after White Lung, man. I'm not going hard after White Lung. I'm just saying. I don't even know what White Lung is. It's okay. <sighs> just, just, say, just saying. I, I've gotten these pitches. You've gotten these pitches. Which actually brings us to a question we got this week. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, wow. You're really doing these transitions right now. Dude, 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 I master transitions on records all day. And that's the other thing about oh this service. Oh, my God. That's the other thing about the service is the tasteful transitions I put from song to song. 
cannot be done by an algorithm, Zach. That's true. And we, two years ago, you know, today is the two year anniversary of Bad Timing Records. And Jesse made beautiful sounding things when he remastered Acceptance's record on vinyl. Can you hear the sound of me blowing on my fingers here? Um, can I do the emoji of the girl painting her nails? Oh, that's a good emoji for you. Oh, I, I use that sunglasses are always the top two. Uh huh. I, uh, my, my top emoji is um, the money wings, which I'm now referring to. Now I'm referring to most of my emojis are all about money, obviously. Uh, so I'm now referring to them when I spell them out as money emojis. So you, you drop the Y and you don't mm. add an extra E. Mm, and it's that's all one good. Word. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Um, it also shows what, what a it. fucking suit you are. I am a suit. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so transitioning into that question we got. Oh, well, uh, a nice human being named, um, oh, Alex, a uh, friend of the show, Alex, at weirder underscore Al, uh, asked, what are some good sites to reach out to for small bands looking to set up for mirrors? Is this the question? That wasn't, that wasn't the question. Nope. That, there was the friends publicity one. Oh, Okay, I didn't know that great we job. wanted to do that. Great job right? fucking up my transition. Dog. Hey, man, this is what happens when you uh, host a podcast with someone that uses Lander. Uh, I'm the founder. Okay, right, this is a good. <laughs> this is an anonymous uh, question. You can ask us questions at offtherecord.fm via Tumblr or by tweeting ask uh, hashtag ask OTR or by emailing us um, at offtherecord fm at gmail.com um and so the question is how do you deal with actual friends asking for write-ups on their music i feel mean whenever i tell them i can't or whenever i don't feel like their music is at a certain level enough yet i've gotten to a point where people cross the line and i get texts about pitches and get asked about them in person uh and so this question was said that it was specifically for me but i also thought that jesse i'm sure has had experience with people wanting him to produce their records because they're friends or for um, him to do maybe cheap, cheap, cheap work for something that will take a lot of time or just put in awkward positions. And this is probably the most continual awkward position I've gotten and put in over the six years or whatever of my life has been um, with this work. Um, At first it was really hard to say no, um, but with... I think I get asked by more people that are definitely not my friends that I definitely don't know for me to post about their music, obviously. Oh, and yeah. That, to me, like, that's where life gets annoying. Um, when, like, just I get text or, I'm sorry, not text, Facebook message after Facebook message after Facebook message that, you know, someone will add me and I, I mistakenly add them on Facebook back. And then within 10 seconds of me adding them, we'll say, hey, I don't know if you're busy right now, but could you post this? I think you'd really like it because you like Blink-182. Um, like those people, I'm never going to post about their music or even or listen to it for management probably. Um, but when it comes down to my friends, like there's a difference, I think, between making fun of music and degrading music and it just not being your thing, right? Like sometimes music that your friends make definitely sucks, but they can still be your friends. And sometimes music that your friends make may not suck. Some people might think it's phenomenal, but it's just not your thing. Um, And so often I'll say, hey, this isn't my thing. I'm not really into this, nothing personal. And a lot of times people take that very personally, of course. Yes. Even though they asked you to listen and to critique it. But, you know, I just try to be honest because I'm not going to have any enthusiasm about posting it or like I'll, I'll feel more dreaded the next time I talk to that person if they want, if I think they're going to ask me to, you know, hook it up again or whatever, you know? Um, and a lot of times people, ask, my friends will ask me to post things and I will because... I would have posted about it anyway. But when it comes down to those awkward situations, like I try not to ignore the request because they'll keep on coming. They'll keep on saying like, Hey man, I know you're busy, but can you, can you do this? Can you do that? And you know, it's never fun to be like, Hey, this isn't my thing. I'm sorry. Um, I'll pass this time. But I think that is the better, uh, path to take really. Yeah. I, I, I have a little bit more of a Jedi move, which is, I just say, 
really busy. Do this in X amount of time. So if it's somebody asking me to produce their record, I say, sorry, we're booked for seven months because no one will wait seven months for their record to be done. Oh, yeah. But now I'm giving away my secret, and I've probably done this to somebody who's listening. It's not really? like an mm-hmm. asshole. You I do that a lot, dude. Yeah? I feel like it's definitely different, though, with you. Well, it's different with me, but I also have the nice benefit of that everybody, anybody who's ever seen my email signature knows I have 22 jobs, even with two not in it right now. Everybody knows I'm busy, but like, there's also things, you know, I keep getting now uh, is, can you write about this for alternative press? And that is an easy one, too, of just, I only write about music business. And I'm not writing about that you dropped a hot new video, son. And... Yeah, I feel like it's hard. Well, for some stuff, like for production, it's way easier. Or I th- feel like it's way easier for someone to be like, oh, he's booked out for the next two months versus someone to me might be like, you asshole, it takes you a minute to write a post. Yes. But like, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, I just bought a PS4 today, Jesse. I don't want to do that. Yeah, you uh, want to be, my re- be playing uh, Grand Date Rape Audio or whatever that game is? Whoa, I bought Batman. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm starting slow. Forgot. I for, don't. For, 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 forgot. You're a feminist. You're, you're, you're not. You're not uh, raping girls on the uh, theft game. I'm definitely going to buy Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> awful. Awful. <laughs> Giving that to that company money is awful. You're a bad person. Okay. Just telling okay. you. Okay. I don't feel bad about it. I think I do. I'll see you after the episode, and then I'll change my mind. Uh, I'm going to tell Grace on you. Uh, she, she knows. <laughs> She rolls her eyes at me all the time. I don't time. know. She was taking a I lot said, of credit, credit for, for making you a feminist the other day I, at the party. I said, I said think something the other day about, like, besides I, I'm very well aware I'm privileged, whatever, whatever. And she's like, man, I don't even talk like that. What happened to you? And I was like, <laughs> the internet. The, you know what the answer to that is? The internet. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened to you. And I'm like, you don't spend time there. You're lucky. <laughs> Um, anyway, so our next subject is uh, that uh, final sales are up 30, 38% since 2014. Yeah, so um, vinyl sales in 2014 were up a very, very, very large number uh, that was 50% from 2013. So um, they went up 50% last year, and they're now halfway through this year are, all, are already up 38%. Without, in my mind, really a lot of landmark albums yet this year, right? Like, the largest album that came out last year is still the most popular album this year, which was Taylor Swift record, but she's not moving vinyl, necessarily. Last year's big vinyl thing was the Jack White thing, right? That was last year? Yes. And he he sold over 70,000 copies of his record on vinyl last year. But it does... And then the, 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 don't forget the Daft Punk. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so it felt like there were a lot of large vinyl pieces last year that were carrying weight. And I'm like, the thing is, I'm sure there are this year, but we're not necessarily hearing about it. So I think they're like a little bit more spread out. Like, whatever, Deja and Tendu by Brand New has sold probably 20,000 copies of vinyl already this year. And that's a lot, but I think there's more in the middle ground of releases selling well across the board rather than one way out ahead. And it's a pretty big deal, I think. Like, I don't. I, I'm curious to see where we end up this year. Obviously, vinyl will not keep growing 50 percent year over year forever. But if we can keep it growing and growing, and then keep it steady or up a few points, down a few points, like I just want it to be sustainable. Um, and if there's more room for it to grow, what I, I would rather it stop now and be sustainable at this level than blow up next year and then burst, you know, and drop 80 percent after, you know, wow. and to go. That's my concern, and I think that is going to happen. Well, I'll tell you exactly what it, what and how it happens. This is happening because we're in a great economy right now, and we have one of the lowest unemployment rates we've had in the modern era. And for as long as that's the case, we're going to be doing great with Vidal because everybody has extra money to spend and that wealth is spread out. But the second the economy starts to recede again, which it always does, we're fucked. And that's what Vidal will start to disappear again and you got real dark there jesse just say it don't vote republican don't vote don't vote trump oh no you know i'm, I'm gonna be honest here i'm switching my re- registration to republican just so i control vote for trump because I, I want that party to just die and he is the death rattle of that party 
It's going to be oh great. My God. I'm very concerned <laughs> about everything right now. <laughs> so the next subject we wanted to discuss was that uh, – a very pretty interesting move. Like I, there's very few times I see a music press release to this tendered old soul of mine uh, that has been reading music press releases for so many years and music news that I see a band do something. And I'm like, well, I've not seen a band of their size do that. Jesse and, goes, "We're not talking about this." Oh, it's uh, this. Oh no, I was saying we're not going to talk about this when you had. Talking about bring me in the horizon and the notes. Uh, you're, you're, okay. you're confused. I'm sorry. I then read that. I, I understand it. if it seemed like that. Yes, it did. But so the main are doing a quite a big handful of dates for a you know mid sized band. They're doing free shows in venues that don't seem like they'd be too open to free shows, and it's be very interesting to find out how this is going down. Yeah, so the main um, released an album called American Candy back in April. Um, and then they did a big tour with Real Friends and Knuckle Puck, Conflict of Interest. Um, and so they just announced a fall tour, and there's two legs of the tour. One of them is where they're playing their album that just came out six months ago in full. And the other is, a, is called the Free For All Tour. And those are both in B and A markets. Um, and they're not necessarily in small venues. They're from five thousand to fifteen hundred cap, five hundred to fifteen hundred cap venues. Um, and it's pretty damn interesting. Like I, uh, a lot of times you'll see, or I, I don't really think anymore. But for example, like Blink did a tour called the Dollar Bill Tour in two thousand three, and it was sponsored by someone. And so I think they were able to write off essentially all the ticket sales. Um, or the cost of the tickets. So, but it, like this tour, the free for all tour, does not have a sponsor. It would seem it's just a so tour. far. We, we might see otherwise, right? And and Jesse, like, what's really interesting to me is the main's fans. I would say seventy eight percent of them are not of the drinking age. That's that, that was going to be my point. Now, I get if. Uh the Dropkick Murphys did this because right. every bar where they see they've booked the Dropkick Murphys, they just know that they made four nights worth of alcohol sales in one night. Yep. But um, you bet better stock up when the Dropkick Murphys are coming to town, dog. But the main, like I remember, yeah. I, and the first day of their tour, I flew out to it in Arizona with, uh, with Knuckle Buck and Real Friends, and I went to the bar to get a drink, and I was the only one there. <laughs> um... So I just, it's so curious to me, like, what's happening here? I don't know, like, who's taking a risk? It seems like they're obviously both taking a risk. Like, I, I just don't know how it's happened. I'm really curious to find out more, but I, I think it's refreshingly interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think it's also a very interesting thing for a band of their size that, like, doesn't have this huge machine behind them of how they can get more people to hear about them and understand what they do. Yeah, I think this is a really, really genius move for the band, band of their size. And I would also venture to say that it'd be pretty hard for a band of any other side to do this uh, size to do this effectively. It seems like this is a really good moment to do something like this. Yeah, and I, and I will say there's way more free shows than there are paid shows. And so I wouldn't have necessarily been as surprised if they sprinkled in three free shows in between 20 paid shows, you know. But there are 15 free shows and only like seven paid ones. Um, and the paid ones are in the AA markets. There's one in New York. There's one in Chicago, et cetera. I'm just, I don't know. I'm really interested because if they're playing House of Blues in Orlando or Game Changer World in New Jersey, which is like 800 cap, like that's a big write off. Because if you sell that out at $20 a ticket, that's obviously a good amount of money. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm curious to see, like someone has to be fronting this bill somehow, or there's some kind of other motivation that I'm just not quite sure of. And I'm really interested in like, uh, I wonder how this will go for them and what that could maybe mean for other people if it goes well, kind of thing. Agreed. Agreed. So the last thing we are going to discuss is how miserable it is when your favorite band is The Walking Dead. And uh, So what does that mean? So two weeks ago, the guitarist of my favorite band, Mew, M-E-W, uh, he quit the band. 
And to say the guitar is a lot of what makes this band is a pretty big understatement. What is um, Mew? The best band on earth. You know, they're brand new's favorite band. Uh, no, that's Marcy. When I was out with your boy, Fred Feldman, he said that Mew was their favorite band, and I think he would know. Okay, man. Um, anywho, um, they're my favorite band. And the guitars quit, and the new record isn't very good. And now I'm po- poised with the decision of, do I get tickets to see them and ruin what has been four of the best live shows I've ever seen in my life, or do I go see them with this ringer guy who looks like somebody's dad playing guitar for them and listen to a new album that I'm not that crazy about. And huh. I figure this so is an interesting thing, to thing because obviously your favorite band is a atrocity these days and has been not putting out good music for many years. My favorite band is literally a disaster. And I think it just sucks. Like I really can't decide whether I should do this or not and whether I really want to, like I find it kind of silly to be like, should I tarnish the thing? But if I were you, I would not go. If I were really? me, I would go. I think I'm a little less emotional than about these things, so I might which be able would, to do it. Which would feel like that you should go, but I would definitely go. Like, this is the thing. If Matt, when Blink tours next year with Matt Skiba, I'm going to go, right? Like, I'm not going to not go. Are you concerned, though, that, like, this new guy can't play the guitar well, though, live? Like, uh, I think what, it's more it's just same... like this, this, this guy is like, the guitarist was like the dude. He's just like, he's amazing. They recorded their last record down the street from my apartment, not the one that just came out, but the one before, and I'd, like, run into them at the pizza place, and, like, they were just... I I just have a a, a very good, like, memory of them, and... Mm -hmm. I just it, it it just I get that for sure. I guess, I guess I'm just uh, you know, I'm thinking about like, the live show like like unlike playing three shitty chords very badly like Tom DeLonge does. This guy is like one of the most artful nuanced guitarists and just not being sitting there and like one of the things I'd enjoy about seeing them is like as somebody who's not even really much of a guitar person, I'm much more of a a drum and synth person and vocals. Uh I just I could get lost in the way this guy plays the guitar live, and I just don't know that the ringer is going to really do that for me. Yeah, I guess it depends what's drawing you to that band. Like, why the Blink thing is weird is because obviously Tom, like, whether he has a good voice or not, like, he sings the songs and wrote the songs and the lyrics, yeah. etc., right? But, like, to me, if a guitarist leaves a band and that the replacement guitarist can still competently play those original songs on guitar, I w- might be very bummed, but I'm probably not going to have a problem with seeing that live. I, I think th- 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 here's the thing. is like, But it seems like you have a different connection to well, this guitar. Here's what I would say is, I think Blink playing later stuff without Travis is a travesty. Jesus. Like, no one plays like him. Whereas, like, Tom on guitar, no one plays like him, but no one definitely sings like him. But, like, <laughs> people could play guitar a lot better than Tom DeLong. Like, yeah, let's be no, honest. For like, sure. it's, no, no, it's for a sure. fucking atrocity line. But he's just years. like, he's just, it, I, I just mean, like, that he's the front man kind of thing. Yeah. So, but, like, I get not why that, but this is a thing of, like, this is, like, part of the signature, and it's just, it's gone now, and it's it sucks, and I just, uh, I, I've I've never. It's very rare that my favorite bands exist in a way for me to like go see them while I'm passionate about them. So it's 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 an odd dilemma. Like you know, it was very easy with me with LCD Sound System. I'd go see them as many times as I could when they were one of my favorite bands. Tortoise. Every time they come, I go see them. Porter Robinson. Every time he comes, I go see him. Very easy stuff. Taking Back Sunday obviously went through similar situations for years where they kept the same singer but went through three different guitarists before yes. circling back around. Um, and people actually have a deep emotional connection to each one of those different guitarists in a different way. So that might be kind of a more apt comparison like in this more direct world um, where some people really obviously love John or some people definitely really love Fred and it seemed like and no one but me loved Fozzie's album. But Oh, so, um, bad, so bad. Well, also everything after that has been terrible too. So no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, there's nothing good about it. Obviously, you know. Um, I think it's a bummer of a thing. But I, I guess to me, if you know, my heart is more typically in the vocals and the lyrics. So if that's the same and the music is as competent, I'm probably gonna still go. I guess unless like they've released three albums in a row now and they're all terrible, and I know they're only gonna play those songs. 
that's to me where like it would start crossing the line. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So you want to do a speed round of some questions? Well, I want you to uh, I want you to recant a dismissal. Oh yeah, you do. All right. So I initially dismissed Dapple Beats one by saying I don't get this. I totally get it now that I see that it's tons of musicians doing their own shows because everybody who loves those musicians now wants the two did and hear and, what they're doing. And tell and everyone hear. else that they're tuning in, right? Yeah, it's definitely it definitely proved to be beyond my sight how good an idea. When it was just like two fuckboy DJs and awesome Zayn Lowe, that seemed silly to me. Now that I see it's Rud the Jewels and Josh Hobie doing it, uh, and like all these people were passionate about shows, the fuck boy from Vampire Weekend, aka one I mean, of the worst cool human beings that, on like, earth. Like I don't care, but it's like it's a get, obviously. That like uh, Elton John has a show, you know. Like I didn't even know he had one, but yeah. I hate him. But that's like a get, you know, like, oh, it's yeah. a big deal. <laughs> now, know? I will also say this though: the times I've tuned into the shows, like I love Run the Jewels. That shit was boring as fuck. Well, it seems like the one that really is catching people's. In, uh, attention is um, St. Vincent's and I don't really know anything about her but if you don't know the premise of her show it's called St. Vincent's Mixtape Delivery and she calls up someone each week and so this week I think she made a playlist for a couple that was about to get married um, and like she walked through it with them kind of thing. So I, I think there's two, there's two potential cruxes. Is one can Apple keep this going for years with many artists and keep it compelling. And then two, are those artists able to actually have a good show? You know, because some are definitely some, it's just like creating content, right? Some stuff that you think is going to be a huge hit is just not going to happen. Totally. And some stuff that you think might be kind of passe might blow up. Um, and I think Apple deserves the benefit of the doubt in that case, since this is new for them, but it seems like they're, it seems like they've really thought it out so far. Like they're they're slowly taking, you know, they're slowly taking the wraps off of more and more of it. And I I saw everyone talk about Beats One on the first day. Then I saw no one talk about it for like four days. And now I see different people talking about it differently every day or so. So it seems like it's persisting a bit. And I don't think Apple has any reason to like ever say the numbers they get. Mm -hmm. But they, even though they also don't have a competitor in this sense, except normal radio. But I, I would just be curious, not even the U.S. numbers. I'm just curious in the worldwide numbers, you know? Like, um, and because obviously, like, uh, whatever, Z100 in New York does not get worldwide coverage. So if Apple, if Apple broadcasts to the whole world, there's obviously exponentially more people that can listen to it than just in the U.S. or just on BBC. So I'm I'm curious to see how it's doing. I don't know that we'll ever find out unless they can it. You know, that would be one quick way for us to find out. But um, it seems like it's going pretty well. I haven't really tuned in since. I would be, I don't know who, like, I don't know that this would be good at all. But the like someone that I could see that I would hit, that I would tune into would be like, like I'm sure eventually like Fall Out Boy would do one. Like who who that I like would do one. Like, I could obviously Taylor Swift doing one, but I don't think I would like anything she'd play necessarily. But, you know, I could see Paramore or Fall Out Boy doing one, but below that, like, it's it would probably be very rare for anyone that I like to, to host something. I really look forward to Fall Out Boy doing one uh, them playing Race Trader songs. What is that? You don't know this? No. Oh, Pete Wentz was in this horrible band that I saw in a basement in Montclair years ago. Like, we're talking like, like a long time ago. ago. <laughs> Not 20. <laughs> like 15. Right. They were called Race Trader. Okay. And uh, I don't remember seeing him, but my friends got into a thing with the singer. But it was, uh, Race Trader was like a whole lot of weird white guilt type of stuff. It was very, very political. Mm. Um, and they were horrible. Um, but yeah, do your Googles, uh, Race Trader. T-R-A-T-O-R, -R, not like trader, like cards. Mm. Right. Okay. Um, so all. recommendations. I'm gonna. I I like a I like a hipster album that Jesse doesn't like. <clears throat> there's a first for everything. That's what so be, being being in Brooklyn is <clears throat> turns Zach into a hipster. Uh, it's called Sometimes I Sit and Think and Sometimes I Just Sit by Courtney Barnett. Um, she is becoming very popular currently. 
I really like the album. I didn't think I would. They're, the second song on the album, for anyone interested, I would recommend listening to the second song on the album first. It's called Pedestrian at Best, and it's kind of like, it's kind of a sick song. It's a sick song. It's really good. It will, I think it will floor people who listen to it. Um, and that's what got me into it. And, uh, you know, go see Taylor Swift on the 1989 World Tour. It's a great, great experience for me. Truly awful. Um, okay. For you recording nerds, me, Joey Sturgis, E.L. Levy, we're doing a recording class in my studio in New York City. If you want to sign up for it, it does cost a good chunk of change, but you will learn more at this than you will learn at uh, recording school. Um, Don't make fun of Drexel. Um, <laughs> UnstoppableRecordingMachine.com has the details, or you can hit me on the socials if you want a link to it. But it's going to be a good old time, and I guarantee you, you will learn a ton. Oh, yeah. Zach signed a band I produced, Romp. Oh, yeah, finally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go, totally. listen, go listen to that EP. It's yeah, great. Romp is tight.bandcamp.com or badtimingrecords.com. Uh, there's an EP called Sorry Not Sorry that is out digitally now that we're going to be putting out physically in the fall ahead of an album. It rules. Like, get into it. Um, and I finished the full length this morning. Oh, God bless. Well, I look forward to hearing that. On uh, on on 128 quality uh, bitrate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Off the Record this week. Uh, we'll be back next week. You can ask us questions, lead us feedback at offtherecord.fm. Thank you for listening. <laughs>